thank you everyone for coming here. Let's give a real Bronx cheer for Bucky and Mike. Let's hear it. October 2nd, it's been 45 years since you hit that home run. Sometimes hey, you, hey. <laughs> you look great, Mike, I got to tell you. you. You look great. Both of you look great. But do you sometimes sit in your bed and say, I, I can't believe it's been 45 years? It's gone by real quick. You know, it doesn't seem like 45 years ago. But, uh, um, you know, Mike and I have been good friends for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, it's been, uh, you know, a nice journey. Uh, but it doesn't seem like 45 years. What about for you, Mike? Uh, the, the time flies. I mean, you were the other end of it. People forget you won two World Series games yeah, for the yeah. Yankees, caught well, the they, last they out. Quick, they? Yeah, they do. Yeah, and you might have won World Series MVP if it wasn't for Reggie hitting a few home runs, right? Yeah, it should have still been co-MVP. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, he pitched, uh, he pitched some great games. But, you know, it was really interesting. You know, I'll tell you the story. Last year, right, we yeah. went back, Mike and I, we got in, invited back to go to Fenway Park, you know, we were going to do A-Rod's show and uh, Red Sox and Yankees were playing and, you know, we, we walked up to Fenway Park and Mike hadn't been back there, what, 30, 40, ever. ever, yeah, they've never invited <laughs> Since him back, that home so run. it was like, an, you know, experience for us because it was like he was walking into Fenway Park for the first time in like 40 years and, uh, you know, it was, it was quite an experience, you know, to, to, to see that, that Boston hadn't invited him back uh, after all this time. Well, let's talk about what led up to that uh, fateful day. Let's talk about the Yankees in 1976. Uh, took on the big red machine in the World Series. They, they pretty much got wiped, and, and they really needed to revamp a little bit. So they brought in Reggie, and famously, as the Bronx is burning, George Steinberg said, you can't win a World Series with Fred Chicken Stanley at shortstop and they made a deal for you. Talk about that day when you got the call that you were going to the Yankees, and there were some interesting players that could have went to the White Sox as well, you, you mentioned. Well, actually, it started, my journey to the Yankees started in 73, really. Um, I, was a, I came up with the White Sox in 73 and a rookie, and um, at the end of the season, um, we were going to a Bulls game. I'd never been to a professional basketball game, and so we were going to the Bulls game, and um, we had seats like three or four rows right behind the Bulls bench. And so we're sitting there and watching them warm up. And these four guys walk in and they sit down in front of us. And my buddy next to me goes, do you know who that is right there? And I go, no. He goes, that's George Steinberg. He owns the New York Yankees. And he says, you want to meet him? I go, sure. Yankees are my team, you know. I tapped him on the shoulder and he turned around. I go, Mr. Steinberg, I'm Bucky Dent. I'm the shortstop for the White Sox. And he goes, I've been trying to get you, kid. And so I was like, oh my God, you know. Well, fast forward to um, 1976, um, Bill Veck bought the club and we went to spring training. It was like the first week of spring training and one of my dearest friends was working for 60 Minutes. And they were doing a store, story on jo George Steinbrenner for spring training. And he said, you got to stay home. Bill Veck and George Steinbrenner are meeting at the Colombian restaurant, and they're going to trade for you. And I said, oh, my God. I stayed home that night, the next night, the next <laughs> night, the next night. Finally, about a week left in spring training, we're playing Kansas City down at Fort Myers, and I'm walking from the field to the clubhouse at Bertie Tebbets, who was one of the great scouts for the Yankees, who I knew for a long time, he, he whistles at me. And I turn around and I go, hey, Bertie, what you doing? He comes over and he goes, are you okay? Why aren't you playing? I go, I don't know. I'm healthy. I can play. Well, what had happened was they didn't want me to play because they were afraid I was going to get hurt. So um, we were getting ready in the spring training um, to go to Toronto to play the Whites. The White Sox were going to open in Toronto. It was the first year of the Blue Jays. And I was putting stuff in my car. I go back, and I hear the phone ring, and I pick it up. We didn't have cell phones back then. So I pick up this phone, and it's, I, this voice goes, Bucky Dent. I go, yeah, who's this? He goes, this is George Steinberg. I go, get out of here. And he goes, I could hear the crowd then, you know, in the background. And I go, oh, this is George, you know. And he goes, uh, I have a deal that will bring you to the New York Yankees if you'll sign a contract. And the great linebacker from the Dolphins, Nick Bonacani, was my agent. So I said, I'll call you back in five minutes. So I hung up real quick and I called Nick and I told him, I said, George called and said he got a trade for me. 
call them up and tell them, make the deal. And so they wound up making the deal. They traded uh, Lamar Hoyt, uh, Oscar Gamble, Bob Polinsky, and 200000 cash. But I also found out that they were, Gendry was in the deal, but then uh, Gabe Paul pulled him out said, no, you're not getting him. Thank God they didn't get him, you know. <laughs> but uh, I wound up getting traded to New York. And Mike, for you, joining the team in 77 was a little later. The great catfish hunter was uh, having some arm issues. Uh, Gidry was still young, an unknown commodity at the time. Talk about when you heard the news that you were going from Charles Finley to George Steinbrenner. Yeah, that, that was crazy. Uh, I had another, uh, of course, Charlie Finley, I don't know a lot of you, you know that he was one of the most uh, colorful owners in baseball. Uh, color uniforms, he came out with white shoes go uh, uniform but they actually they were pretty nice looking you know the Oakland A's back then but anyway um, I was traded uh, from Baltimore I won 20 games in 75 uh, Don Baylor and I was traded for Reggie and Ken Holtzman and they went to Baltimore and we went out to Oakland and I would uh, it was my walk year uh, the year I was when the uh, before I got traded it, it was going to be my free agent year and uh, Joe Romo, the trainer, well, I was in, in, the, um, in Anaheim, uh, just sitting in the lobby, and I saw Joe Romo, he was sitting over there, and uh, he went over to the telephone, I guess they paged him, Joe Romo, Joe Romo, telephone, so he got over there, and he was talking, then all at once, he starts walking towards me, and he said, Mike, I said, hey, Joe, what's up? He said, Charlie told me to tell you that you've been traded, I went, what? To whoever he said, he said, uh, he said, I don't know. He said, I want you to call him. So anyway, I ended up calling him, and uh, he says, Well, you know, I can't sign you. He's trying to sign me at that time. He was trying to give me three year contract, seventy five thousand a year. I'm going, what? I said, Get the hell out of here, Charlie. I'm not signing that kind of contract. Well, that's why I traded you. He said. <laughs> so I ended up coming to the Yankees. Uh, I didn't join him right away uh, at that time. Uh, my wife was having, she was a uh, uh, French Canadian and uh, she was having, she was pregnant, having a baby. And I, I left when the Yankees trade and went to Montreal and I was there for about a week, 10 days. I kept reading that uh, Billy was going to find me $500 a day if I didn't get my butt over to join the team. And, uh, but anyway, it worked out. And that's when I came over from the Yankees, from the Oakland A's. And uh, it was, uh, I was happy that uh, I, I knew they had a good team, and, uh, but I didn't know how crazy they were. But they were, I came from a team that was just as crazy, the Oakland A's team. Unbelievable. Well, to talk about being crazy, the reason was that the Yankees, you know, they had made a lot of good trades, brought Chris Chambliss over Greg Nettles, but they went and got the big lefty power hitter, Reggie Jackson. So you really walked into a power vacuum right there when you got there. What was the training camp like, uh, particularly after Reggie made the famous quote to Sport Magazine, I'm the straw that stirs the drink, and Munson can stir the, stir the straw, but only stirs it badly. So, so you get there, so, so, so was it, how much of a distraction was the friction from playing ball? Because I know, I know the team got off to a slow start. You know, Mike will tell you, you know, that team that we played on in 77, it didn't matter, you know, we had the son of Sam with the blackouts, you know, we had a lot of things going on. And then you had the Reggie and the Billy and the, you know, Munson and George, you know, and uh, it was a lot of chaos. But the one thing about that team that we played on is whatever happened off the field never affected them on the field. They, between the lines, they were killers. They, they, they wanted to beat your brains out. You know, they were, they were tough. A lot of players talk about a, a harmonious clubhouse. How was it that you guys were so tough and were not harmonious but still able to win? What was the difference with that team? Well, I tell you, um, they, when I came over, um, it took a while for – but when I came over, I mean, I was pitching like every seventh and eighth day. Remember, yeah. Bucky? I, and I didn't have any kind of rhythm or anything. Now, I, I got knocked out. I think I was uh, pitching against Detroit in, at Yankee Stadium, and um, I got taken out about the third inning, and I was really mad. Uh, I got a bat, and I tore the clubhouse up. You know, Peachy is like, and then now I got dressed, took a shower, was leaving. The elevator door opens up. Lord and behold, I was going up to the parking lot to get the hell out. George Steinbrenner comes walking out. He says to me, 
where are you going? I said, I'm getting the hell out of here, going home. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, what's going on? I said, George, I, I said, I, you know, this is crazy. You, uh, he said, you know, I traded three guys for you, and, uh, you know, I'd like to see, you know, get your shit together. I go, well, I, yeah, I said, yeah, I'd like to, yeah, George. But I said, look, Billy has a, a tough time. He, he has like seven starters, eight starters. I mean, I'm not pitching until seven or eight, nine days. I said, what, what, what can I do? I mean, I know I, I've, I've been used to pitching every fourth day. The rest three days, pitch the fourth day. Well, let me, let me go talk to Billy. He reaches in his pocket, gives out $400 and gives me, go have dinner on me. I said, oh, thank you there, George. <laughs> so anyway, I guess he went up the next day, and then the next day, morning, Billy calls me in his office, and he starts screaming at me. Oh, and then, of course, I scream back at him, too, because that's kind of a team we had. Guys, you know, we stood up for, each, uh, for yourself there. You had to. So I said, wait a minute, oh, no, shut the head, you know, let me, I didn't go up there to his office to, to, to cry. I said, he happened to catch me as I was going up the elevator. And I told him the story, and oh, and I said, and he said, all right, he told me that, you know, you're not happy you're pitching, you know, like the way I'm pitching. I said, no, I said, I'm a big guy. I need the ball, but I, I like to have the ball pitch every third, fourth day. I didn't give, you know, well, okay, you're pitching in three days. I said, okay, give me the ball. Seven straight complete games. And he went, oh, well, he went, okay. So. They, they don't do that anymore. No, they don't do that anymore. Yeah. Seven straight complete games. I mean. Uh, Billy's yeah. my best buddy then. Oh, he loved that. <laughs> you know, you mentioned, Bucky, earlier about that summer. It was the summer of Sam. Elvis died. Blackouts. The heat wave. I try to explain that New York City was combustible back yeah. then. That summer was rough. It was spooky. Travel around, you know. I mean, uh, um, you you didn't go anywhere where you didn't feel un, you know easy about it. You know, especially in the city. You know, when that was going on, it was not fun. You just kind of stayed out of the city. Uh, finally, uh, the team really got going. Apparently, Reggie Jackson wanted to back clean up, and there was a lot of meetings with Billy Martin about it. Um, you know, it was, talk about Reggie getting going in the second half and really earning his, his money. And, and what, why was it important for a player to back clean up? Because today you have power hitters hitting second, third, leading off. It was, it was no, a different time. Fifth or sixth, wasn't he? Was, they had him hitting like uh, sixth, seventh. They yeah, put yeah. him down in the lineup. Yeah. And he didn't like that. And he was, uh, you know, he was going up to telling George, and George, I guess, you know, screaming at Billy, put him back in the, in the number four spot. And, uh, after he did that, it, things started calming down, and the team, everybody started gelling together, and, you know, we started taking off. Yeah, a lot of characters on that team that don't get the press. Mickey Rivers was one of those characters. He was a real table setter for you guys. Talk about what Mickey meant to that line. <laughs> Mickey was one of the funniest guys I ever played with. I mean, talented, unbelievable talented, you know, but he... Um, he was one character that uh, you just love him, you know. I mean, he's he was a great player, and uh, you know, there's some funny stories about him. And uh, when Gossage came over, I, you know, we're talking about you know, Goose and I started together in 1970, and uh, he came over in '78, Goose, and he wasn't he started out rough, you know, he was struggling early, you know, he was trying to do too much, and. Um, so one night, uh, they used to have the little car, the Toyota car in the bullpen to bring the reliever in. <laughs> and um, so, um, you know, Mickey's looking and he sees Goose warming up, you know, and he's looking at Billy, you know, and sees Billy come out of the dugout and go, go like this. And when the little car started to come out, Mickey jumped on the car and said, no, don't bring this guy in. You know, we're trying to win, you know. So, so Goose is kicking the wish, get off the car, get off the car, you know. And so the car came around and, and, and Goose was mad. Man, he was mad. He got out and he went to the mound and you could tell right then. See, I came up with Goose and I knew, you know, how good he was. And so Munson sat down and the first two pitches Goose threw, you could see you know, it was like, and, you know, Munson would like, oh, whoa, you know, and he threw eight pitches, and he threw eight of the hardest pitches you'd ever want to see, and then when he got ready, he took the rosin bag, and he threw it down, and he turned around, and Munson was standing up with his mask on top of his hat, and he goes, what, and Munson goes, 
look out in center field. So Goose turned around, and Nikki was facing the fence <laughs> in a three-point stance, you know. And Goose goes, ah, ah, you know, he started, you know, screaming at him. You know, he turned around, and from that time on, Goose was Goose. I mean, it just like the light came on. Woke him up. It woke him up, and um, he was unbelievable after that. So 1977, the Reggie turns it on, and uh, and the, you guys are hold off the Orioles and the Red Sox. Uh, it was really tough the AL East back then because we both had great teams. The Orioles won 1979. The Red Sox made it to World Series in '75 and won 99 games in, in, in 1978. Then you go on to play Kansas City, and Kansas City takes you to Game Five, and you guys are down. Re Martin bench Reggie because Reggie wasn't hitting in that game. Um, Talk about you know going against Kansas City and what a tough team they were, and you guys had to make an incredible comeback in, in, in game number five. Well, there was two situations, and I, I forgot it was game two in New York that McCray took Willie out on a roll block, blocked mm. him and knocked him all the way almost to center field, and then after that, you know, I mean, you could that team you didn't want to wake them up, you know, and that kind of everybody went, oh, okay. They want to play that way, you know, we're going to kill them, you know. And I don't think they turned a double play after that because everybody was going in there. And then in game five, uh, Brett slid into Nettles at third base. I, I think uh, somebody hit a triple, and I went out to catch the ball and turn and throw it to third base at Nettles, and Brett slid into him real hard, and they got into a, a, a real fist fight, you know. And so every bench is emptied, and everybody's over there, and – what was interesting is the umpires didn't throw anybody out. <laughs> yeah. They knew they they understood the game back then. You know, I mean, teams are on the field, they're fist fighting. You know, going at it and it was all over. You dust your okay. You're over here. You're over here. Let's play ball. But then, you know, Mike did a tremendous job in that game. Yeah, Mike came in relief the game, and also Sparky Lyle. Really game in the, came pitch in five game. and a third five game, and a third game before, and you pitched how many game innings? Six and two thirds. Here's a good one. This is really funny. I get to the stadium that morning, uh, and then Billy asked me, "How you feel?" I go, I "Feel good." I pitched the third game in New York, I believe it was. Got knocked out after about 85 pitches. Uh, so anyway, in the morning, he said, well, Billy calls me in and says, uh, how you feeling? I said, man, okay. And he says, well, look, go out to the bullpen. You know, we don't win this game today. We're going home. So I said, okay. Um, you know, if you need me, I'm ready. What the hell? So I go out there. Now, Gidry gets, starts the game. And uh, I think they get two runs in the first inning. And now he gets in trouble the second inning. They score two more runs, and he loads the bases at that time. Now, at that time, uh, Billy came out and, to and then he said, get Torres up. I got up. Would you believe I threw six pitches warming up? I never, you know, I hadn't warmed, <laughs> pitched in relief. And I said, Cloyd Boyer was our yeah. uh, bullpen coach. And he said, Mike, Billy's coming back out. I said, you're kidding me. You're, I, I've only thrown six pitches. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. I, got, I, got, now I knew I had nine pitches to warm up before I faced the first hitter. So I said, God, I got to, got to get the circulation. I got to run. I ran my butt as fast as I could to the mound. I knew I had about a hundred yard dash. So from Kansas City bullpen on the mound. So I got kind of loose, and, then, and surprisingly, I felt pretty good. Got two strikeouts and a pop up, and we were out of the inning. I held them for the six two thirds. Now I'm really proud because what I did. If I don't pitch the way I did, we never gotten in that World Series, in seventy mm seven. -hmm. Yeah. In hell, Kansas City. And, that, you know, I grew up in the Kansas City area. And I had a lot of high school. Uh, when I went to high school in Topeka and Kansas City, I had family and everybody. I don't know who they were rooting for me or rooting for the Royals. Uh, but anyway, we held them. And, you know, leaving that stadium, sitting on the back of that bus, I looked down in Royal Stadium and looked, and I said, man, we're going to the World Series. And that was beautiful. That's a beautiful feeling. What was it like back going back to New York, knowing you guys won? I mean, talk about that feeling. Like, did you feel a little bit of pressure was off of you? Of course, there was still, still business to take care of, but you feel like a little bit of pressure was off well, of you? Well, the Kansas City series was tough. Yeah, you know? that was, was a tough, tough, tough series. Yeah, they, they were built for turf. Um, you know, they had speed. They had power. They, they had a really good team, you know, and um, they uh, – they were tough, but, you know, we beat them. So you take on the Dodgers. Uh, Don Gullett pitches game one, the Catfish in game two. You split with the Dodgers. I still think Steve Garvey was safe at home plate in game, in game number one. I thought he was out. <laughs> <laughs> 
you go to LA and uh, Mike, you and Gidry take care of business out in LA. Yeah, the third game. I pitched the third game, complete game. Uh, it was uh, I was pumped up, man. And when you when you get in the World Series in a game like that, you get fifty plus thousand people sitting around screaming. Of course, not maybe for us because we were the visitors, but well, LA doesn't it, really scream like oh, New York screams. It's just a beautiful. It's a beautiful feeling, you know. That, uh, that and that's what every kid's dream is. Growing up. As a young kid, college or high school, getting into a World Series and being in a World Series. I mean, that's that was that's everybody's goal. So you come back to New York, up three games to two, and then uh, uh, fireworks with, with, with Mr. October, Reggie Jackson. I, I mean, talk about being on the bench, seeing that. And, of course, Mike, you pitched game six, won two games in the World Series, 18 innings, two complete games. Simply incredible. Talk about uh, Reggie's performance and, and overall knowing as you were getting closer, the innings going on and on and on, that this thing was going to be yours. You were going to be world champions. You're, yeah. You accomplished the goal. I know it. Well, you know, my, my, my buddy here slipped in the first inning, remember? Yeah. And uh, that, they scored two runs off me in that first inning. And Bucky usually is pretty uh, sure. Reggie handed, Smith. But he slipped. I saw that he slipped, and uh, <laughs> he didn't. He would have made the play easy. But his foot went from under him. I went, oh, shit. So, yeah, that, he went, oh, shit. I, I, I dropped the ball. I dropped the ball. And it's the first time I, I, I picked the ball up and I went, oh, my God, I made an error in the World Series. Oh, crap. And I, for a second, I lost my – I just picked the ball up and I threw it back in. And I was like, oh, my God. And then they wound up scoring two runs. And I went and sat down on the dugout and I, I was like, I just made an error in the World Series. It cost us the World Series, you know? And then all of a sudden, bing, bang, boom, you know, Reggie went off, you know, and they forgot, everybody forgot about my error. <laughs> As a young kid, many people in the audience that were, I guess, around 10, 11, maybe 15 years old, younger and that stuff, uh, to be watching that on television, his performance and seeing Babe Ruth's name and then Reggie Jackson's name, it was simply incredible because I remember growing up looking at the magazines and Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and Mickey Mantle and Joe DiMaggio was something like from another planet. And to see a guy during you know, my time, as I was a fan of, to do that was, was simply incredible. So, um, you know, talk about Reggie as a teammate and as a hitter. Uh, do we look at Reggie because we're New Yorkers as he was a better, that he was better than he was? Or would you say that Reggie was probably one of the best in the, in the league? Go ahead, Mike. Hmm, I wish Mickey was here. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> I wish Mickey was yeah, here. Yeah, I wish Rivers was here. You know? He could. Uh, no, Reggie, Reggie um, you know, it was uh, when it, the right time he happened to hit the home runs at the right time. And, uh, you know, he, he, Reggie was a good teammate. Uh, a lot of guys didn't like him. Um, in fact, when he had some signings, right, Bucky, mm -hmm. uh, he didn't show up with our team. So it was kind of like, hey, what the hell? Come on, Reggie. Um, but he, you know, he was, uh, I think, because uh, a couple times in the bus, when he would get back there with the players, all of us, the guys would get on him, and he ended up with two buses that we, that he ended up going with the media up in front bus, so he wouldn't sit with us in the players' back bus. Yeah. He kind of... <laughs> Reg, Reggie, like, i tell you what, though, what he did do was... He took the press pressure off everybody because the media went to talk to him right. after the game, and we all left. <laughs> he did take the pressure off everybody, you know. But um, not only his performance, but his performance in Game Seven, um, you know, or Game Six in that World Series. And I always say, tell the story. I'll never forget. You know, Lacey's coming up. You could see the crowd starting to, you know, line the edge of the. The field, and I remember '76 watching the game when Channels hit the home run. They all ran on the field, so I'm standing at shortstop, and I'm going, "Okay, if Mike gets this out, am I going to run jump on him, or am I going to run for my life?" You know, to the dugout, you know. And then Lee Lacy went to drop a bunt down, and he popped it up, and he caught it. And I swear, by the time I got to the mound, there had to be 500 people beat me to the mound, you know. And they started <laughs> ripping and grabbing things, and you know, and ran for the dugout and people were jumping over the dugout and I'll never forget, somebody jumped in front of me and I fell and uh, I forgot who caught me in the dugout, you know, but it was it was scary, but it was something that you you don't forget. Do you still have that ball, Mike? 
I don't know who got that ball. I mean, you know, back back then we never thought we never about thought keeping about anything, uh, you know, like they do today. I mean, I didn't think anything mm -hmm. about keeping the ball or anything. Mm -hmm. I, you know what I did? I gave it to my brother, but he never did give it back to me. <laughs> Shame on him. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, no, but, you know, back in, uh, I mean, Bucky, you can, yeah, we never mm -hmm. thought about saving. They used to give us top bubblegum cards, you know, and, and boxes. Mm -hmm. I throw them things away. I didn't even save them. I mean, <laughs> I said, ask the guys, you guys want this? Here, just in a, in a way. I just never, we never thought that it was going to be uh, the way it turned out to be, you know, everybody uh, wanting to uh, has signing, <laughs> t-shirts, or uh, your uniform shirts and all that. Yeah. We just didn't save them at that time. No, we had to hand them back in. Yeah, here, you know, you had to yeah. turn it back in, yeah. Uh, first thing as a souvenir that anybody gave me was when I came up as a rookie in 73 with the White Sox, my first stolen base, um, I came in after the game and Roger Bosser, who was the field guy, gave me the second base, you know, for my first stolen base and they, they wrote on it, you know, your first stolen base, whatever, 1973. That's the first thing anybody ever gave me. So your world champions, 1977, how long were you able to relish in it? And Mike, how come you didn't come back? They didn't give me enough money. <laughs> <laughs> no, Boston gave me a, a seven seven year guaranteed contract. I wanted to stay, honestly, I wanted to stay. And I was mad at my agent, Gary Walker, who was also Reggie's agent. And I said, Gary, what, you know, the Yankees don't want to keep me? What the hell's going on? But it took him, he, he didn't like flying. So he was in Arizona and he had took a bus, a bus that he drove all the way from Arizona to New York. It was like a week. I said, God, I was like anxious. And then he, I guess he was talking to Gay Paul at the time. And I don't know whether if it's Steinbrenner or Gay Paul who didn't, didn't want to pull the trick. But I would have signed a four-year contract with the Yankees if the money would have been, you know, pretty equal. Uh, but they, they didn't come back with it. That's, it was kind of weird. So, hell, I took the money and went on to Boston. Back then, I didn't know, you know, if I was going to pitch seven more years. Because I was uh, just turned 31, uh, or 30, I'm sorry. But I did pitch in all seven years. So, so 78 opens, opening day Yankee Stadium, all the Reggie bars are on the field. Uh, things, things didn't start out too well in 78. The, the team, team struggled a little, a little bit, Bucky. Yeah, we, we, um, I fouled the ball off my leg in spring training, so um, I had a blood clot. And uh, so um, I missed, Catfish was hurt. We had some other guys. Mickey was hurt in a little bit, and we didn't start off very well. And uh, Red Sox were playing 750 baseball the first part of the season, and they were like running away with it. And then all of a sudden, we started to get healthy. And the one thing that we had was Ron Guidry in '78. Every fifth day, we knew we were going to win. And then guys started getting healthy. We started getting guys back. And Catfish came back, he won like five games in a row, and we started winning three out of four, four out of five, and Boston started to get nicked up. And so we started to get close, and we said if we could pick up one game a week till we get to September, we play them seven times, you know, we'll have a chance to catch them. Hey, guys like Jay Johnstone, Gary Thomas, and Paul Blair, Brian Doyle, Jim Spencer, you know, filled in during those injuries out how important that bench was for you guys. So. You guys fall 14 games back, and things start to fall apart with Billy Martin. I mean, things had to be crazy at that time um, when Martin technically resigned from, from the team. Talk about what you remember with, with Billy Martin resigning and how tumultuous it felt at that time. Well, I had missed that period of time, you know, when um, all that stuff was going. I pulled a hamstring in California really bad, and they sent me to Florida because I tried to come back twice too soon and they sent me to Florida. So I was gone for 40 days like. And so I kind of missed all of that time when Billy, you know, and Reggie, were, all that was going on. And, uh, you know, Billy wind up resigning. Um, uh, and, you know, I got back and I'll never forget though, when I got back, Bob Lemon took over. And I'll never forget him walking in the clubhouse. The papers were on strike. So there was nothing negative being written at the time. And Bob walked in and said, okay, you guys were world champions last year. You can do it again. And it was almost like a balloon was popped and it, it, everybody went, Phew. we just kind of relaxed. And you could start 
playing baseball, not reading negative things in the paper, and we just caught fire and started playing really good. Yeah, for you young media students, newspapers ruled the roost back then. There was no ESPN. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, the writers were on uh, on strike. Every day you had to come in. And watch, there, there was the Post. There was the Daily News, and you know it had all this stuff on the back page and headlines and stuff like that. And it was it was crazy time. So, Mike, you must be laughing. Your team's fourteen games up. You're, you're loaded with players like Freddie Lynn. Carl Yastrzemski, Dwight Evans, uh, the boomer George Scott at first base, Carlton Fisk, Jim Rice. Uh, Jim, Jim Rice. I mean, and, and then slowly the Yankees start pecking away and the, and the word choke started coming around. What, what, well, what I mean, that's that, Buck, what Bucky just said. The, the, the press wasn't writing. There was nothing to read about with the guys. But in Boston, where I was at, they started writing, the press started writing, how are we going to lose it to the Yankees? How are we going to, all negative. It was unbelievable in Boston. We had this lead, but the writers were writing, they said, well, they're probably going to blow it some way or somehow, like they do every year. And I'm going, God, that's what Boston, Boston, they always, I remember reading a lot of stuff. But the reason we, I think we lost, we had Bill Lee, spaceman, you know, uh, and I was with him in Seattle. We were going to the ballpark, and he said, Mike, I'm supposed to pitch the first game back in Boston because we were out in Seattle, and Jack Rogers, our traveling secretary, hadn't given me my ticket so I could get home uh, before the team. Instead of getting home at 5 or 6 in the morning, I'd usually get home about midnight and get a good night's sleep and get ready to pitch. So anyway, we get dressed. Zimmer is sitting down. He's their manager, Don Zimmer. He's sitting there watching Seattle. Some of their hitters are hitting early, and Bill Lee's gets on the dugout hanging right in front of, uh, you know, Zimmer. And he said, how come uh, Jack Rogers he hadn't given me my ticket so I can get home and pitch in the first game? Went, you ain't going to pitch nothing. You're not going to be We're like, what the hell's going on here? And Zimmer said, yeah, you go see Haywood Sullivan. I guess Bill Lee called in the paper that Zimmer had as a buffalo head. Uh, manager and a gerbil, 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 gerbil. gerbil. <laughs> and I guess Zimmer got mad. He called him a gerbil. It was like crazy. So Billy going, ah. but you know, he took him out of the rotation. They bought this kid up, Bobby Sproul. Started six or seven games. We never won a game with this with him coming up in Triple A. And Billy could pitch. Billy had like seven or eight wins already. And he knew how to pitch in Fenway. You know, he was that type of guy. Nothing bothered him. I mean, he was, you know, Bill. He oh, yeah. turned the ball over on the left-hander. And he knew how to pitch. But once he took him out of the rotation, because we had Tion, uh, Eckersley, myself, and uh, Bill Lee. And our, it was us, us four. And once he did that, it really messed up our rotation. And I still say the reason uh, we lost it that year is because he, uh, Zimmer took Bill Lee out of the rotation. Talk about the bad blood that was really still lingering from 76, that big, huge brawl with Pinnell and then Nettles taking, really hurting Bill Lee and Bill Lee. Oh, I yeah. saw him a few years ago and he said he keeps a picture of Greg Nettles in his back pocket so, <laughs> Nettles, so Nettles can kiss his ass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Bill, Spaceman, that's why they call him Spaceman. Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's a character. Wow. He's a character, man. He is a character. But we had a great team. The, um, I, I think the 78 and 78 Red Sox were the two best teams in baseball, mm -hmm. even though, you know, we had to play a one-game playoff. I'd like to have played a seven-game series with them, and it would have been a great, would have been great. great series. But we had, I think, the, the, our both teams were the two best teams in baseball. Now, was there a hatred or was there a mutual respect? Mm, I think both. Both. I think it was both. They, they didn't like us. We didn't like them once they got there. So I had a change of thought of mine when I got, you know, I loved the Yankees when I was there with them. Then I had to go hear these guys, uh, goddamn Yankees, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> God, oh, shit. Yeah. So the Yankees, 14 games back, they come in uh, to Fenway Park in December. It becomes known as the Boston Massacre. What was the mindset of, of the Red Sox after getting swept like that in their home park? I mean, uh, I, well, it evened up this, you know, the season. Uh, it ended up there were four. We were four games up, and <laughs> even the 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 season up uh, where we were tied. But um, no, it was just one of those things. We just I, I pitched the first game. I got knocked out, and I said, "Damn," <laughs> you know. Neckersley the next day pitches. He gets knocked out. I mean, they yeah they buggy whipped us for four games. So yeah. Bucky, a surprise, uh, Catfish Hunter, my first jersey I ever bought was Catfish Hunter's jersey, my, one of my favorite, one of my favorite players growing up. He uh, returned for, uh, to his old form for, for one last time down the stretch. He had some problems with his shoulder, and they did, they did a, 
kind of a manipulation on his shoulder where they put him to sleep and they put a like a steel ball in his hand and it you know kind of broke all the adhesions in his shoulders in his shoulder and he came back and he was throwing the ball really well I think he won like five in a row uh, but his shoulder was still not right it was you know it started bothering him again and he pitched the last day um, against uh, Rick Waits I think it was yeah, from was Cleveland that, that game. yeah and uh, catfish got banged around and we kept looking at the scoreboard Tion shut out Toronto and you know we got beat I forgot what the score was seven to two or seven to three or something like that and I'll never forget walking up the tunnel somebody said crap we lost the coin flip we got to go to Boston to play <laughs> tomorrow and it was like oh god we got to go up there and play you know and so you know we uh, we got on the plane and we we flew up there and uh you know, it was one of the greatest games ever. I talk about the coin flip first. Um, Al Rosen chose heads. Mm -hmm. George Steinbrenner laced it in, it laced into him, calling him a blink, blink moron. Don't you know? Seventy-five percent of the time, it comes in tails. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you had to blame somebody. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, getting ready to go up to Boston. Uh, Gidry won twenty-four games to that point. Was was twenty-four and three. Had an incredible season. One point seven four ERA. Uh, he wasn't panicked. He he took a nap underneath the trainer's table uh, yeah. I, when, when I talked to him a few years ago and then certainly written in books. He was calm, cool, and collected. But, uh, and I've talked to you in the past about it, describe the pressure that you felt going into that game. Well, it was kind of interesting because uh, I was telling the story today. We flew to Boston and all the wives wanted to go to Boston for the game because it was such a big game. So they all gathered and they went up to see George. And so they're all going there and he's kind of mad, you know. And, uh, and so my wife at the time, you know, they designated her to talk. So she starts talking to George about, you know, we all want to go, you know, we think we should be able to go, you know, to this big game and this and that and the other. And he started yelling at her like, what the hell are you feeding your husband? He's like one for 20 something, you know. And so she shut up quick, you know. And so. When she got to Boston that night, she said, she was telling me this story, and so I got mad. I'm going, what? And so everybody was going to Daisy Buchanan's, you know, because, you know, we don't want to stay in a room and get nervous. So we all said, okay, we're going to Daisy Buchanan. So we get in the elevator, punch the lobby, going down. All of a sudden, the elevator stops and the doors open, and guess who's standing there? George Steinbrenner. And I'm going, oh boy, this ought to be a fun ride. So he gets on, he don't say anything, I don't say anything. You know, it was real frosty in there. He stops at the second floor, and he's when he, when he goes to get off, he turns around and he goes, tomorrow's going to be your day, you know? And I go, yeah, okay, you know, the door's closed, so bang. You know, so we go to Daisy Buchanan's, and so, you know, we, we go to the park the next day, and, you know, it was, you could feel the difference in the team. You know, it was, you know, a beautiful crystal clear day. But you could tell the intensity was there, you know, between both teams. You know, it was, um, it, it was a, a little more edgy. Guys did their work, but it was a little more edgy. What about for your part, Mike? How did you feel uh, going to the game? You obviously felt great. You were, you were tossing a gem for a while. Yeah, no, I felt good. I mean, I loved the challenge, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I was, never was scared to, to get the ball. Just give it to me, you know. I do the best I can as long as I can. Um, I was a little bit nervous, but nothing, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say scared, you know, I've never been scared to pitch. Uh, I took it and I said, hey, I pitched a good game. I had, shut, I had him shut down 2 nothing, going two outs in the seventh inning. Thank you, Bucky. <laughs> well, I, I guess the moment we're all waiting for that we're talking about 45 years later, and we're talking about 100 years from now when we're all gone, um, talk about that inning and that at-bat, Bucky. What, what, was, what was your mindset? What did you want to do? And what was the team feeling at that point? I'm sure they were like, something's got to break for us here. Well, before the game, um, we were taking batting practice. And I was in Mickey Rivers' group. And uh, so I kept thinking about what George said, you know, and I was getting more mad, you know, what he said, you know. So I said, hey, hey, homie, let me, let me use your bat. So um, he gave me the bat, and I went in, and I took some balls, and I hit some balls, and I started feeling pretty good. And I hit a ball, and it right on the end, and it got a hairline crack right under the tape. 
So um, I didn't wear my shin guard that day. I wore a guard all year after I had a blood clot. You know, I made some bootleg shin guard and, um, and I wore it. So when I came up in the seventh inning, Mike was pitching a great game. And um, so he threw a sinker down and in on me and I fouled it off my foot. And when I went back to the on-deck circle, Gene Monahan came out and, you know, sprayed my foot. And I had to play because we only had 24 guys that day. Willie had a hamstring and he couldn't play. And Lemon had, made, had to make a choice, pinch hit for Brian Doyle or pinch hit for me. So he pinched hit for Doyle. And so when I fouled the ball off and I go back, and it took a lot longer than I thought. And Mike didn't throw any warm-up pitches. He kind of thought it was going to be quick and... He just kind of stood there on the mound. So, uh, you know, when I started back, Mickey goes, hey, homie. He says, you, you got the wrong bat, you know. <laughs> that court and bat. This one's got a home run. <laughs> and, and so he gets to the bat boy, and the bat boy comes up and gives me a bat, and I walked up in the first pitch. Mike tried to throw a fastball in on me, and I hit it pretty good, but I didn't know if it was going out. You know, I mean, um, I didn't know if it was high enough. Mike, explain yourself. <laughs> Mickey told me the bat he gave Bucky was cork. No, he didn't. <laughs> now listen, old timers day. We were at old timers day. And I, when I came back, I forgot what year it was. And so somebody had gotten caught for hitting a ball with a cork bat. And so Mickey was standing over there and Mike was getting dressed. He was down there and I go, hey Mickey, why don't you tell Mickey that bat you gave me was corked? And he went nuts. Oh, I knew that bat was corked, you know. <laughs> but uh, we don't know what Well, we've bat. had a lot of fun with it, though. Yeah. I mean, whatever it was. Um, in fact, I didn't think the ball was going out when he hit it anyway. Because once I saw Yaz, you know, doing this in his glove, and then he started backing up, and he backed another step. And he looked up, and the ball just went out. Oh, my God, I went. Well, anyway, uh it was a it was a hell of a game. It was a it was a super game. Uh, one of the best games that I even it felt like a World Series game. And it was it was a good feeling, even though I lost. But hey, we you know both two, two great teams that played that day. Yep. Uh, clash of Titans. I tell you what, that was the most pressure game I ever played in my life. I mean, the game started build in you know two to nothing. Then it was three to two, and then. You know, you could feel it in the seventh inning. It started to build and the, the electricity and the tension, you know, and then it came down to the ninth inning. Um, actually, Pinella made two great plays in that game. He made one earlier in the game, fighting the sun, playing right field. He, he, he talked about, you know, Gidry didn't have his great stuff because he was pitching on short days, and he moved over right when Freddie Lynn came up and he hooked a slider, and he made a great catch against the wall. And then in the ninth inning, um, uh, in right field, again, the sun was tough. Burleson was on first, and Jerry Remy hit a, like a low liner, and he kind of lost it and kind of battled it, and he put his glove up, and Burleson stopped at second. And then Rice hit a ball that would have tied the game if he had went to third. You mean Reggie wouldn't have made that play if he was out there? Oh, <laughs> no, a ball would have hit him right between the eyes. <laughs> talk, talk about Yaz, you know, a baseball legend, you know, coming up in that last at bat. What was going? Did you want the ball hit to you? You don't know what goes through your brain, you know. I mean, you're going through it, you know. and It comes down to, okay, here it is, Goose against Yastrzemski, you know. Either, and Monson's just waving him on, not even doing signals. He's just like, bring it, big just boy. Just going like that, just throw it, you know, but... Um, and that was funny because, you know, he tell he never liked to catch pop ups. I used to like to go and catch pop ups. He didn't like to catch pop flies, so, you know, he's yelling goose, come on, pop him up, goose, pop him up, goose. And so, goose reached back and threw a fastball. It must have jumped this much and right down the middle, and he popped it up to Nettles, and then he said, no, not to me, you know. <laughs> and he caught it awkwardly. He caught it awkwardly. Like yeah, you know, he caught it off to the side, you know, and. Uh, the, the thing about it, I was telling the story today, was that when the ball went up, I used to go over and catch the pop-ups. I felt something go down my arm. And so I'm going, God, I got a bug in my shirt, you know? And I look and my metal had broke and the chain had run down my arm. And so I'm looking like this and I'm pulling this chain out, you know? And Nettles catches it. I'm looking on the ground trying to find my metal. Everybody runs over there, so I said, 
I'm running in. So we all go in the clubhouse. I go out about 10 minutes later, and I'm walking around on the field trying to find my damn medal, and I can't find it. I go back in, take my shirt off. As I took my shirt off, it had fallen down in my cup. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh, here it is, you know. <laughs> so I take it out and I go in the trainer room. You know, everybody's drinking and I go in the trainer room and Gidry and Pinella and a bunch of guys were in there and there's a knock on the door. And so I, I go over and open the door. Guess who it is? <laughs> George. George and, and I open the door and he, and he looks at me and he goes, I told you it was going to be your day. I told you it was going to be your day. And I looked at him and I go, yeah, and if I'd have struck out, you'd have treated my ass. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 smile on his face. and the storybook ending didn't end there for you. People forget, uh, beyond that home run, you were the World Series MVP in 1978. You came back from two games down to beat the Dodgers. Yeah. Um, you know, just talk about that series. And uh, it was really uh, you know, the cherry on, on, the, on the Sunday for you to win well, a World MVP. You know, we went... We went from Boston to Kansas City, you know, played a tough series, and then we went to, to L.A., and we lost the first two games, and, and I'll never forget, we're going back on the flight, and, you know, everybody was loose. You know, that team was always loose, and Munson was back there, and he had a few beers, and he goes, well, he said, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. They didn't pick us to win the division. They didn't pick us to win the playoff game. They didn't pick us to beat Kansas City. We're down two to nothing. Gidry's going to beat him Friday night. We're going to beat him four straight. We're going to be world champions. He was, you know, laughing and giggling and joking. And that's what happened. We went back home, Gidry, and then Nettles had some great plays in that game three at third base. We won that game. And then I think it was the Sunday game that Reggie stuck his rear end out and let the ball hit him. Yeah, it was... <coughs> It was one who. Ron Say's still mad at that. Oh, everybody's still mad at it. Sort of still screaming about it, you know. But there was a play where um, I think uh, Pinella hit a line drive right at Russell. Russell, and Russell dropped it. And, uh, you know, they didn't rule a double play. So he picked it up, stepped on it, threw the ball, and Reggie was standing there, and he kind of like just put his rear end out, and the ball glanced off of him. And then, you know, everything hit the fan, and we won't come back and won that game. and. Then we won Sunday and went out to L.A. and beat him again. Mike, for you, uh, a winter of discontent, I guess. But um, talk about I'm watching the game. <laughs> <laughs> talk about the, the psychological aspect. A lot of players and pitchers have been affected by, you know, not not being the hero. A goat back then meant being a goat, not like a goat today. Um, Donnie Moore gave up the home runs against the Red Sox in 1986. Took his life. Talk about your mental fortitude to go on and then have some more great years with the Red Sox and be a mentor. Doc Gooden sat here last year, talked about what a mentor you were for Doc Gooden with the Mets in 83, 84. Mm -hmm. For him, talk about that fortitude you had to continue on and have a great career. Well, it, it, you know, it's interesting. Uh, like I said, back then, you just try to help everybody that you could. Bob Gibson helped me as a, when I was a rookie, when I first came up with the Cardinals. And um, he was uh, he was tough. I mean, he's one of the toughest. And look at me, because he taught me to throw my slider. Got his locker right next to Bob, and uh, I was sitting there one time, and I, uh, I said, I said, I was like this, and I said, Hey, Bob. He looks and he goes, like that that particular look, like the hell do you want? I said, Can you teach me how you throw your slider? He said, God damn it, Rook. I say, you gonna be here tomorrow at two o'clock? I go, yeah. Well, you better be here, you know. I'm gonna come out here, but if you're not here, I'm gonna kick your butt. I'm like, okay, I'll be here. But, so he taught me how to throw the slider. And uh, to learn from him, and you know, uh, back then, we used to get, they don't do that anymore today. They don't bring veterans in. Like the old timers day game, we used to sit with the old timers, they tell us stories. It was great, and and, and Yank, you know, at least with the Yankees, when you know, even old timers, Dan, we have they put us in another room away from the today players. It's kind of weird. We don't even get to talk to them really. Why, why is that? I think that's one of the the, the biggest things that um, the history. The one thing about George Steinbrenner is he loved the history and the Yankees. You know, I mean, he was a little tough to play for. 
you know, you knew what it, what it meant to him as far as coming over there, you know, cut your hair, look like a Yankee, you know, and do all that kind of stuff. But he really believed in the history and having, you know, Yankee guys around. And, you know, like Mike said, 77 was one of the greatest old-timer days I can ever remember. It was my first one. You know, you had DiMaggio, Barra, Mantle, Maris, you know, Allie Reynolds, Bobby Richardson, all the greats, and Moose Gowan and, and Hank Bauer. And they would, you would have one of those guys in your locker and you would get to talk to them. You know, they'd tell stories which were, were phenomenal. And what's happened over the years is that, um, like, I don't think the guys, the younger guys today, because we're not in the locker room with them anymore. We dress down the left field line. And they're missing out on, they don't even really know who we are. And, you know, they really don't come out and watch the game when we played the game. But I think that's a that's very valuable to to the young players. Like Mike said, you know, like I used to talk to Kubek, whoever was in my locker, you know, you'd talk to them and they would tell you stuff about the old days and, you know, the Yankees of, of old and, you know, they could tell you stories. Moose Garn could remember from 1954 in the third inning of game three <laughs> what he did, you know, and it was great. And I think that, you know, they're losing a little bit of that, you know, by, and George always had like Mantle and, you know, Barra and Whitey Ford and guys in spring training around the players, you know, and I think that that's so valuable. It would be remiss if I didn't mention Thurman Munson. Uh, Yankee captain, incredible player. Mike, you played, and, and back then there were three catchers in baseball, Johnny Bench, Thurman Munson, and Carlton Fisk. Mike, you played with Munson, you played with uh, Fisk. Fisk, and you, you, played, you also faced Bench. Bench, an incredible player, a lot of power. Uh, Munson, higher average, probably hit 50 points higher than Bench, but not as many home runs, and Fisk was kind of in between. Talk about Munson, and, you know, as far as him being one of the great ones of his generation. Well, here's a good one, a quick story. We were in Cleveland, I'm pitching Sunday, and Bill, but lucky you remember this. Billy gave Thurman an off day the next day then I'm pitching. So I get to the stadium and, and I go into the tra training room and Thurman is on a table. Oh, God, God darn Billy. I said, better words. I can say something better, but I'm not that son of a... I said, Thurman, what the hell's wrong? I said, Mike, God damn Billy told me that I was not going to play today. I went out with the guys. I got too many. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not feeling too good. I'm not. I'm still kind of hungover. I go, no. I go, why do you put you in? Why don't you tell him? Oh hell with them. I ain't going in. I, so anyway, I thought I had an off day. He went out with catfish and the guys. He, and he said, Mike, I, I'm not thinking right now. Look, whatever you want to throw, throw it. I'll catch it. <laughs> I said, Thurman, are you, are you crazy? I'm just telling you. I can't. I can't think. Just, just throw me anything you want. I'll catch the damn thing. I went, oh, well, okay. Well, hell, I set out Cleveland, and, and by, he said, by the fourth inning, that came over to me. He said, I'm starting to sweat the shit out now, he says. <laughs> so I'm starting to feel better. I'm starting to think a little bit better. I said, good, good. Yeah. So he caught, I'll tell you, four innings, I didn't, he didn't give me a sign. I threw whatever I wanted to, and he was catching it. <laughs> that was great. I mean, that's one of the best stories. That, and, yeah. Because Billy had get, told him he was not going to catch the next day. Lord and behold, he put him in the lineup. Thurman was one of the toughest guys I ever played with. I mean, he played hurt all the time. He was a little bit, you know, he was sarcastic at times. You know, he could get you really going at certain times. You know, if you were struggling, um, he wasn't a guy that would give you a lot of sympathy. You know, like if he'd stand around the cage or something, he'd walk up to you and look at you and go, are you trying? You know, and it would just like irritate the crap out of you, you know. Yeah, I'm trying, you know, but he would say stuff sarcastically, you know, and uh, uh, but he was he was a, a great teammate. Uh, August second, the, the day that will live in infamy for New York Yankees. You're at the World Trade Center, and I've heard you describe how you heard the news that Thurman had passed. Yeah, it was probably one of the, the saddest days. You know, I came down. We had an off day, and uh, I was having dinner at the World Trade, and I came down to get my car. And the valet guy goes, "Aren't you Bucky Dent?" I go, "Yeah, boys. Shame what happened to Thurman." I go, "What are you talking about?" And he goes, "You got killed in a plane crash." And I was like. 
oh my God. I said, was there anybody else in the plane? He goes, well, there was two other ones, you know, and the last time I saw Thurman, we played Sunday in Chicago. We we had Monday off, and all I could vision was, was it Bobby Mercer and his wife? Were, you know, was he going to fly back with Thurman, you know, to uh, Canton? And uh, But it wasn't it wasn't them, but now that was a tough stretch, probably one of the toughest stretch as an athlete you ever, ever have to go through. And that game at Yankee Stadium, mm -hmm. returning, I mean, the tears, tears oh, yeah. of everybody. I'll, I'll never forget it was, yeah. you know, the Monday night crew came out to the game, Cassell, Jackson. Um, yeah, we left home plate empty. Left home plate empty. We, you know, we went out and the home plate was empty and everybody's like emotionally drained. And uh, Jerry Naren was the catcher that night. He, he was the one that, went to home plate to be, to be the catcher. But he was a great, great guy.